worship, allow me to read for you Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord which is thy refuge, even the Most High thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. The choice for today's scripture reading was kind of difficult. Uh, always uh, tough to, to uh, bypass Psalms as, as a scripture reference. And particularly this week with David's prayer for revival and restoration, um, that's something that that we need today as well. But uh, what I have chosen is uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, verses <laughs> 1 through 4 and verses 16 and 17. And I, I think these verses in particular are a message that we also need. Romans chapter 1, uh, as I said, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his, his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. 
in verse 16, he goes on to say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And rather than uh, taking more of Pastor Dave's time uh, to, to elaborate on all these verses, uh, there, there is so much, and, well, and let, let me just say, as he would say, this will preach. <laughs> so, uh, faith, faith is the victory given to us by our Lord. If you'll please take up your hymnals once more and stand as you're able. We're going to turn to hymn 636. We gather together, hymn 636. Well, today I want you to take your Bible and join me in Acts chapter 28. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 today. Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. I want to entitle the message today, Divine Providence and the Gloomy Island. Divine Providence and the Gloomy Island. So if you're there in Acts 28, which is the last chapter of the book of Acts, we'll begin in verse 1. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. The barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled the fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said amongst themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Divine Providence and the Gloomy Island. That sounds like a, a name for a good TV show, doesn't it? Divine Providence and the Gloomy Island. Well, let me ask a question. We know what's happened Prior to this in the story, in 27, we had them in the ship, and they're being driven by the storm, right? And the storm 
they, and we had quite a bit about it, uh, the, the anchors and the, the sounding and the boat that they had to cut away and Paul's message to them about being delivered and them finding the shore and the creek that ran and, and them you know, releasing the anchors and driving the boat into the sandbar and, and it being broken up. And I mean, it was all so dramatic. Uh, and then they find themselves on the beach. And that's where we begin here in verse 1 of chapter, 20, chapter 28. So let me ask you a question. Would divine providence make you pass through a horrible storm deprive you of sleep and food, cast you into the sea, and make you swim for your life, suffer the bite of a venomous snake, and the indignities of a barbarous people, just so God could be glorified in the gospel advanced? I hear answers. Just so God could be glorified in the gospel advanced. Now, until you get to that last phrase in my question, you're saying no. <laughs> No, 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 this is, we don't want to even consider this as a possibility, do we? And so many of us would ask the question, well, what about me? I mean, that's really the culture of our day. It's a, it's a me culture. And we would ask the question, wait a minute, what about me? We would ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? We would get all gloomy inside. What do you mean God's providence would put me in a horrible storm? What do you mean he would deprive me of sleep and food? What do you mean he would cast me into the sea? What do you mean I would suffer the bite of a venomous snake? Are you kidding me? Yeah, he would. If you're his, and he would do it for his own glory, and so the gospel could be advanced. And that's really what this story here on Miletus, or Malta, is about. You notice there it says in verse 1, when they were escaped, of course, that's escaped from the sea. You know, the ship was broken up on a sandbar, which was further out from the shore of the island. So they had to swim to shore in the surf and the storm. It's a wonder that none of them drowned, but of course, they had a promise. When they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. Now, this island is off of the southwest coast of Italy. You can go there today. We call it Malta. It is below Sicily. And originally, this island was settled by Phoenician traders. And the name means refuge in the Phoenician language. Refuge. I was reading um, this week F.F. Bruce's commentary on this uh, passage. And he suggests the following paraphrase for the last phrase of verse 1. Then they knew that the island was called Melita. He suggests this, quote, We recognize that it was well named. We recognize that it was well named. This, of course, he's putting into the, into the language of Luke, because Luke's the one recording this. And we have the first person plural so many times here that F.F. F. Bruce just says, why don't we just let Luke speak now? Let's hear his voice. And he says, let's recognize or we recognize that it was well named. Malta, even though it was well named, was not on their itinerary. They didn't want to go to Malta. Nobody in that boat wanted to go to Malta. Malta was not where they wanted to go. That wasn't the place that they were bound for, you know. They wanted to go to Rome, and they had, a, they had an itinerary of how to get to Rome. And it didn't include going across open ocean and shipwrecking on this little island of Malta. However, even though their itinerary didn't say Malta somewhere or Melita, it didn't say it anywhere on their itinerary, However, the Lord needed the apostle and his men to go there. And so through him and them and 275 others onto the island because the Lord needed them there. And so after all that they had suffered, after all that they had been through, they ended up on the place that the Lord needed them to be. Notice verse 2. It says, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. Now, the word barbarous is used 
not to describe their rudeness of manner, but to identify these people as non-Greek speaking and probably also as non-Latin speaking. I'm sure there were Latin speakers there because that would have been the political language of the day. And so I'm sure this fellow, we read about him in verse 7, Publius, who's the chief man or the head man of the island. I'm sure he spoke Latin. As a matter of fact, his name sounds Latin, doesn't it? Publius. But the, the idea or the word that's used barbarous, and the Greek word is barbaroi. So we understand just, we could read the Greek word and know exactly what we're talking about. These non-Greek speakers, non-Latin speakers. So it's not that they are rude or crude in any sort of way. It's just that they didn't speak, they didn't speak the language. So if you went to France today and you tried to speak French, they would call you a barbarian. Right? Even if you'd studied French, high school, college, you know, and you had your French down pat, you knew how to conjugate the verbs and you knew the way the sentence structure worked and all of that, as soon as you opened your mouth, they would turn their nose up at you. And we do that even today, don't we? Uh, people who can't speak real good English, we kind of turn our nose up at them a little bit. How come they don't know how to speak our language? You know, we, we probably don't call them barbarians, but we have a prejudice. And this was the prejudice. This was a word to describe the prejudice against the fact that they couldn't speak good Greek or good Latin, probably. So these are barbarous peoples. Um, they showed us no little kindness, it says. Now, notice that language there, no little kindness. The words no little kindness could be translated, and maybe they are translated this way in your copy of God's Word, uh, an extraordinary kindness or an extraordinary uh, phil uh, philanthropy. Maybe that's the way you have it translated there. It is extraordinary. That word no little means it's out of the ordinary. It's something extra. And the word kindness is a compound Greek word, philo anthropia. It's two words in Greek that are jammed together. The Greeks love to do that. They love to jam together words. And this is the word where we get our word philanthropy from. Philo, meaning love or brotherly love, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, philo, and anthropoi, which means man or men or human. So it's love for men. It's that general love for men. Anthrop uh, um, Philanthropy, and we understand philanthropy. We have that even today in our country, and we use that word in English. So this is a loan word for us. Philoanthropia, a love of men or humans, a care for the human race. We have that quite a bit in our culture. And notice how they treated the castaways here. They kindled a fire, it says. So seeing the ship breaking up in the surf, the survivors clinging to life, as they pulled themselves from the waves, the people of the island provided the very first thing a cold-soaked human would need, a fire. And they didn't ask any questions about who they were or where they were from. They didn't check if they could pronounce the language correctly. They just said, come over here, and they built a fire for them. And so we have their philanthropy described for us in this passage. Kindness. Be careful of kindness today. It's not that it's a bad thing, but it cloaks something. And we're going to see that here amongst these people, their kindness is a cloak. And it says there that they received us, every one. So again, their kindness is seen. Their love of humanity is seen. They received us, every one. Again, F.F. F. Bruce suggests the translation, they brought us to the fire, or rather they refreshed us. So you can see how that might fit exactly in this passage. They kindled a fire and they refreshed us, or they kindled the fire and then they brought us to the fire. So these people who lived on this island understood shipwrecks, understood the rage of the sea, and so they saw these folks 
in a shipwreck, crawling up onto the shore, and they ran out to them and brought them into, probably inside someplace, under some sort of shelter, and built a fire to refresh them. So what are we witnessing here? We're witnessing the common collision between humans and nature. And, of course, that will spark any heart to deeds of care. Despite our divisions, our commonalities override all in times of crisis. We can be from different countries, different groups, different places, different ages. It doesn't matter. When tragedy strikes, we as humans are engaging in philanthropic activity every time. We love to do that. We love to help one another because this is, this is who we are. We, we, we join together. There's unity in that kind of time of crisis. Yet, not only do we see the, the kindness or the outworking of this philanthropy amongst the barbarians of the island, but there's something else here too that we really shouldn't pass up on. And that is that God made a promise to Paul on the boat. Do you remember that? Chapter 27, verses 23 and 24. For there stood by me this night, this is Paul speaking, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So in that shipwreck, the breaking up of the boat, the swimming to shore, everyone, 276 souls remain alive. No one is lost. They come around the fire and they're, they're receiving the kindness of these strangers on the island of Malta and they count heads and everyone's there. Why? Because God had made them a promise. They didn't die in the wreck. They didn't die in the sea. No one was carried under by an undertow. Everybody made it to shore. Everybody made it around this fire. And I believe, as I said once before when I preached from this passage, just imagine the size of that boat. 276 people. Do you know we couldn't put 276 people in this room? Imagine this room, balcony and down here, filled with people, wall to wall. Not enough seats, not enough standing room. This auditorium will hold 180 at best. You put 200 in here and we're going out the door. 276 and you got people out on the lawn, if you're going to keep in code. That's a lot of people. So this boat was huge. And now all of those folks are gathered about a fire. Because, not because of the kindness of the barbarians, no, but because of the kindness and the promise of God. His long suffering has brought them there. Notice next it says, They kindled a fire, received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. This is such a gloomy picture, isn't it? You can just feel it. I mean, when you read this, you, you have a visceral response to it. It's one thing to be wet, but it's wet on top of rain on top of the cold, and you can just imagine there must have been cloud cover, the deck was low, the clouds are gray, there's no sun, and if there's a wind, oh, you can feel it. You can just feel it. Everyone is wet, everyone is scared, everyone is sandy. No doubt this increased the melancholy of the shipwrecked, but it also stirred up the compassion of the people of Malta. Matthew Henry says that this is written for our imitation that we may hence learn to be compassionate to those that are in distress and misery and to relieve and succor them in the utmost difficulty and to the utmost of our ability. Yes, written for our imitation. So, what do you do when shipwrecked on an island that was not on your itinerary? What do you do when you've been driven for weeks by a storm in the open ocean? You find, yourself, you find yourself now shipwrecked, wet, sandy, miserable. You know, the, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 9, that a man's heart devises his way, 
but the Lord directs his steps. This is an instance in Paul's life where the Lord is directing his steps. Paul thought he would go to Rome. He never once imagined Malta. But the Lord had a different idea in mind, and he directed his steps. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we've all been to Malta, or we're on our way there. We don't want to go there. Not like this. But remember, divine providence has a way of using us for his own glory, not according to our designs, but according to his. And notice the design of God. Verse 3. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire. Paul was not above gathering sticks. But also notice that Paul is gathering sticks. I don't know, and I'll just be honest with you, if it was me, I might be... I might be crying in my shoulder over this. I, I don't, I don't want to gather sticks. I just want to sit there by the fire and be quiet. I want to get warm. I want to get dry. Please let me get dry. I want to get the sand out of my clothes. I don't want to think about what's just happened. You know, I don't want any of that. But here's the apostle who's risen above his feelings and his emotions in the moment. And he's doing something for these people. He's gathering sticks. And you can just see him coming in from the ocean side with a bundle of driftwood. And he's going to put that on the fire. He made it hotter by the addition of adding more comfort to more wet people. 276 of them. Plus the people of Malta that have been helping them. It's a big crowd here. We need a big fire to make sure that everybody gets dry, nobody gets sick, that everybody finds comfort. Paul was not grumpy. Paul was not selfish. His disposition was not gloomy like the weather, but he brought a bout of sunshine to the room by making the fire larger and hotter and brighter. The only thing that should be below us, ladies and gentlemen, is sin. That's it. It's not helping others. It's not doing good. The only thing that should be below us is sin. This is also a harbinger of what is about to be received by the people of the island because this fire represents the light of the gospel that will be preached there because of the man who now is acting as a servant putting wood on a fire. Paul's there. Might as well be useful. You're there. Might as well be useful. And then notice what happens. You, everything seems to be turning around. And then the snake. Notice that. A viper came out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Don't know what kind of snake this is. The, the Greek, the common Greek, just says viper. Probably some sort of poisonous animal or maybe some sort of constricting animal. Uh, I read one, one gentleman who said that perhaps that this was one of those snakes that didn't have fangs but had a row of teeth that he would clamp down on the flesh of his victim and then coil around it. So maybe that's what Paul had, some sort of constricting snake, and it had wrapped himself around his arm and had latched on to his hand that way. Yeah. And so they see this on them, and they think, oh, my goodness. Of course, here's, you know, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute, what they thought. But Satan is always wanting to stop the good hand of God's people. Sin is so easily besets us, and Satan himself prowls around like a roaring lion looking to devour us. But thanks be to God, we have the victory in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This viper comes out and stops the hand, but does it stop him? No. Is it going to prevent the gospel light from being shed on this island? No. Is it going to stop the preaching of the gospel? No. Not, not, one, not one whit. Because as soon as Paul sees this thing on his hand, he just shakes it off into the fire. And that's what we're to do as well. See, he had so many things against him. He had the gloom and the wet and the cold and the sand and the shipwreck and now a snake attached to his arm. Well, he just 
slings that thing off and into the fire it goes. Which is, of course, exactly what's going to happen to Satan. We're going to sling him off and into the fire of hell. It's exactly what's going to happen to him. Paul gathers the wood, makes the fire larger, does the work for these people. And that's not just a work of kindness or philanthropy, but this is a work of the gospel light coming to an island because here is the apostle to preach the gospel, to shake off the attack of Satan, and to do the work that needs to be done. Now we come to verse 4. When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said amongst themselves... Now notice exactly how fickle these people are. And, and Luke uses... In verse 4, the same word, barbaroi. These are barbarians. And here we're going to see just how barbarous they really are. No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. So they make up their mind about Paul suddenly. Now, these folks had enough light to know that evil pursues sinners. They knew inwardly that the vengeance of God will sooner or later meet the transgressor, especially those who commit crimes against human life. Remember, these folks are philanthropic. They understand love of, of men, and they also understand crimes against men. So they understand what should happen here. They see the snake on his hand. They know he's a prisoner. He's in prison attire. He's on his way to Rome to be tried. So they just put two and two together. Well, he got out of the sea, this prisoner, but he must be a murderer because now he's going to die. They had enough light to know that evil pursues sinners. And yes, it does. But Paul had a promise. And here we have the manifestation of the promise. Not only does, does he have the promise that was made to him and all 275 others on the boat, but he has the promise from Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 says, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So this is exactly what happens here. The serpent has bitten Paul. He just shakes it off. And this passage in Mark chapter 16, verse 18, this is for the apostolic age. This is not for us. Don't, don't you know, gather up a rattlesnake and put it in a box and bring it to church. Okay, we're not going to do that. Paul doesn't do that. Let's not tempt God by doing something silly like that. Because that promise is not for us. It was for the apostles in that age, but it is not for us. But Paul knew the promise, and he knew what that snake meant, and he slings it off into the fire and goes about his work. He shook off the beast and the fire felt no harm. Howbeit, when they looked and should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after when they looked a great while, they saw no harm come to him. But the apostolic period was marked by all of these amazing things. And this is one such demonstration of God's protecting hand upon the apostles right here. Yes, now they were martyred and they lost their lives for Christ, but God used them in miraculous ways. And so when the people see this, this marks Paul out as special and someone to listen to. So now they, they've been watching him this whole time. Now they see the snake gone and he's not dead. They decide this guy is something special. But just as they had enough light to know that evil pursues sinners, they had enough darkness to create an idol. Because you'll notice there in verse 6 it says, They changed their minds and said that he was a god. Notice how quickly they go from murderer to God. Does that seem extreme to anybody else? They could go from murderer to a God, just like that. Just like in Acts 14 when they go from God to let's kill him. You remember that? Yeah. They, they go so quickly from that in the attempted murder of Paul and Barnabas there at um, Iconium. Don't be fooled by their kindness. We so often conflate kindness with Christianity. 
If they act like we they if we if they act like we think they should act, if they speak like we think they should speak as polite people, then we just assume they're believers when in actuality their hearts are as black as night. You see, even barbarians can act kindly. Even barbarians can build a fire and show love for humankind. Even a barbarian can do that. And while I'm on this particular point, let me just say this as well. Be careful of Christian action that is nothing more than philanthropic. If it ends in in philanthropy and doesn't share the gospel, it is not Christian. It may be done by Christian people, but it is not Christian. Just because we do something nice for others doesn't mean that there's a gospel message in it. These people were doing something nice, doing something nice and kind, and it was extraordinary, and it was wonderful, and it showed love for humanity and love for these people. But ladies and gentlemen, they were lost and headed for the fire themselves. Be very careful about judging folks according to their kindness to you. We live amongst the barbarians. They're everywhere. And unless we separate ourselves from them by sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel and telling them about Jesus and building the fire light brightly to point to the Savior, that we are no different, even though we do nice things. God had designed this trip for them to Malta for one reason, for his glory and for the spreading of the gospel. It is our job, no matter where we find ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, to build the fire of the gospel. Here's how I want to apply this lesson today. No matter where we find ourselves and no matter how we got there, It is our job to build the fire of the gospel. We must remember that we are not off course, but right where the Holy Ghost wants us to be, among the people that he wants us to minister to. Sometimes we think when we land on Malta shore that it's a mistake. God surely would not have asked us to come here to do this, to do that, to whatever. Forget about all that. Where are you? Build the light of the gospel where you are. This is what the Holy Spirit wants from us. This is why the Lord has put us there. Also remember that Satan will try to stop your work. He will latch onto your hand in a second. He doesn't want you to build a fire for the gospel on Malta or anywhere else. Your sufferings will be an example to the lost ones around you. Don't don't hate the suffering. Suffering's bad and it hurts sometimes. It's difficult, and it's, sometimes it's cloudy and rainy and cold and sandy and worse. But remember, your sufferings will be an example to the lost ones around you when you connect it to the gospel of Christ. And then finally, know this. You are surrounded. No matter how civilized, kind, compassionate, and people-friendly folks are, it doesn't mean that they are born again. You must share the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. And the gospel of Jesus is not the world's wisdom, and it is not the world's way. It is foolishness to the world. So understand that as well. They're not going to like it when you begin to share the gospel. And as soon as you begin to share the gospel, guess what? You're going to find out just how barbarous they really are until they come to know Jesus, and then they'll thank God on your behalf. It is our job to build the fire of the gospel. We must remember that Satan will try to stop our work, and we must know that we are surrounded, and that we must be on our game all the time. We must understand that we are in a fight. This is a battle. It's not easy. It never has been. If you'll please stand once more, we're going to turn in our hymnals to hymn 334. Hymn 334, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
Father, we thank you so much for this example of the apostle and the kindness that is shown here to him and the gospel that is communicated to these folks on Malta. Lord, we thank you for glorifying yourself through the apostle. Now, Lord, we ask that you would glorify yourself by us as well. May, that would be the most wonderful thing that any of us could ever say is that you glorified yourself in us, in the people of Creek Road Baptist Church. Father, do your work. Use us for your glory. Father, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.